Okay, let's start. <clears throat> let's start with the author's note on um, Roman numeral eight. <clears throat> Alexander, who's an American writer, he's writing this, I believe, in the very late 50s is when he began it. He tells us the, the Chronicle of the Land of Prydain is not a retelling or retranslation of Welsh mythology. Prydain is not Wales. Not entirely, at least. The reason he tells us that is because a lot of the names that are used here come almost straight out of Welsh mythology. Okay? The description of the land matches Welsh, Welsh mythology. And <clears throat> what happens to sorry, I put sword, sword. what happens to some of the characters at the end of the series, the very end, uh, the end of the High King novel, is similar to some things that happen in Welsh mythology and various things in between. You know, the, the Lord of the Dead, the Realm of the Dead, all that's right out of Welsh mythology. So he says, the inspiration for it comes from that magnificent land and its legends, but essentially, Pridane is a country existing only in the imagination. And if you read that essay by Tolkien um, that we talked about last week that I uh, posted a link to, Tolkien talks about what the author does, is that the author, you know, essentially creates a secondary world that lives in your mind while you're reading. So that's what he's talking about here. A few of its inhabitants are drawn from the ancient tales. For example, Gwydion. Okay? There are actual heroes named Gwydion in Welsh history, not just Welsh mythology. Okay? Aron, the dread lord of Anubin, comes from the Mabinogion, classic collection of Welsh legends, which date from the 12th century and later, but it's thought the material comes much earlier than that. And there's an authentic mythological basis for Aron's cauldron, Henwin, the oracular pig, the old enchanter Dalbin, and many others. You know, the next book is the Black Cauldron. Nothing like the stupid Disney or whoever did it version of it. That's it, the Disney version of it is kind of a mixture of things. Okay, so he says, but Terran, the assistant pig keeper, like Ilongwe, they're mine. They're his characters. They have nothing to do with Welsh legend. Okay, so skip the next little paragraph and go to the last one. The Chronicle of Pridain is a fantasy world, you know, duh. Such things never happen in real life. What does he mean, such things? Like magic pigs. Magic pigs? Pigs that tell the future? Right, okay. What else? The Enchantress. The Enchantress Akron? Okay. The Horn King. The Horn King? Cauldron born people. Okay. Huh? The Gwythaints or Gwythaints, the flesh eating bird like things. I mean, they're not vultures because they attack the living things. And they've got like steel talons, you know. So, all those kinds of things. So, it's a fantasy. Such things never happen in real life. Or do they? Well, each of those kinds of things is a tool. It's a tool for what? It's a tool to help advance the plot. The plot is what's important. Is the plot about, initially at least, chasing down Henwin? No. Well, on a surface level it is. But it's only the surface level. So why isn't it? I mean, I thought it was more so talking about how you can wish for something, but until you've experienced it, like you don't really know what you're wishing for. Very good. It's exactly what it is. This novel can be called what's called a German word. Bildungsroman. This means novel. Okay. This means character. It's a novel of character building. 
the development and growth of a character. Guess what? Star Wars, the first three films, are the exact same thing. They're the growth and development of Luke Skywalker. The second three of Anakin Skywalker. And the last three, I don't really know. <laughs> really? It's, it's a little disjointed. Okay? So, or do they? That is, do these talk about things that are that don't happen in real life? Most of us are called on to perform tasks far beyond what we can do. We don't think we're called on to do things like that, but there will come times in your life when you've got to do something that your brain tells you, I can't do this, and you slog through and do it. Our capabilities seldom match our aspirations. Talk about the opening, the very opening of the novel. What does Taryn want to do? Before that. I mean, yes, he does want to do that. Sorry, I have to burn he wants to learn how to make a sword. He wants to make a sword. What is call? That's the pig keeper. Answer one of the quiz questions. What is call teaching him to make? Horseshoes, which are more useful? Depends, right? He said they had no horses, so we think horseshoes weren't. Taryn says, we don't have any horseshoes. Why are we making hor horses? Why are we making horseshoes? What's the purpose? Is it to make actual horseshoes? Yes, it is. Go a little bit deeper. He's teaching him how to make. He's teaching him craft. How to take something from one form and do what? Turn it into a different form. Why? Because that's a skill you can translate into a whole bunch of different opportunities in life. Taryn thinks it's all about what? It's not the process. It's the final product. He wants to make a sword. Why? What was your first answer? He wants to be a hero. And heroes act with swords. Heroes kill. In Taryn's mind. Okay? Where's Taryn get this thought from? Are we told that he goes to the library and checks out books about heroes? Does he read our three and stuff? The book of three, possibly. He's heard stories about Gwydion. He knows Gwydion's a hero because he has a sword. And seemingly, like, you know, in order to be a hero, in Taryn's mind, you have to have a sword and what else? Because he's really surprised. When he finds out Call's a great hero. He's a baller and a pool ball. He's so bold. We're going we're gonna to look at that in a moment. So, our capabilities seldom match our aspirations, and we are often woefully unprepared. So what does that mean? When we are unprepared and we're thrust into a situation that we don't think we can do, do you just roll over and give up? You try you might not succeed, but you try. To this extent, we are all assistant pig keepers. What does he mean? What? Like, it's a job that seems like, you know, low or whatever, but it's so important and, you know, you're, you're more than your job. I don't, I don't know what you guys do for an occupation, a job, if you have a job. I'm assuming most of you do. Some of you might flip burgers at McDonald's or somewhere. I doubt that that takes up all of your intellectual abilities. Probably while you're flipping those burgers, your mind may be off somewhere else. You're thinking, God, I don't want to be flipping these burgers for the rest of my life. I want to do something else. Those are those aspirations. Okay. He says, to that extent, we are all assistant pig keepers. That is, when we start this novel... We're not Call. We're not Dalvin. We're not Gwydion. We're Terrence. Every one of us. Why? I don't know about you. I've had quote unquote dreams, aspirations. I'm not equipped to reach. But how often do you dream or aspire for something beneath you? That's not dreaming, right? That's what? Settling. Settling. That's giving up. That is totally giving up. In high school, for a few years, I pole walked. I wasn't any good. Uh, 13 feet, I think, was the highest I got. OK? 
right? Another guy got 14 and a half feet, something like that. World record at the time was 19 feet. But I tried. I knew I'm never going to be very good. But I kept going. I could have said, nope, not going to do it. I'm just going to try to do 8-6 every meet. Well, I could already do 8-6. So 9, you know, you keep, you strive for more kind of a thing. Okay? So we've got the map. Skip the map. Chapter 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through this almost chapter by chapter. We'll skip a lot of pages. Some pages we'll spend a lot of time on. I have no idea how long this will take because I've never taught this in a three-hour class. It's usually been either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday. I, I might zip right through and we might be done an hour and a half. Uh, it might be 10 o'clock. I'm kidding. It won't be 10 o'clock. <laughs> we'll leave at night. So, the very opening sentence, Taryn wanted to make a sword, but Call charged with the practical side of his education. So notice that implies there's what else to his education? There's a non-practical side. A theoretical side. Philosophy. Does that mean philosophy is irrelevant? No, it doesn't. It just means it's knowledge-based. This is what? Practice-based. What does that mean, though? Praxis, you're putting it into action, okay? You're actually physically doing something, okay? So, so they've been working on horseshoes all morning long. Taryn's tired, his arms hurt, his face is covered in soot, okay? And he says, I could do better at making a sword. Well, how does he know that? He doesn't. So why does he say it? Because he wants to. Because with swords, you can swing them, you can hit trees, you can, you know, chop branches off, you can pretend fight. He can't do that with horseshoes. All you can do with horseshoes is stick a stupid pole in the ground and try to, you know, throw the horse. <laughs> okay. So Call tries to help him. Call says, you know, I've, I've held a sword before. And so he teaches. He starts to teach Taryn a few basic moves. I once took several years ago with two of my kids, my, my two eldest kids at that time, and I don't remember how old they were. They weren't very old. 10, 11, 11, 12, something like that. And they really were 10 and 12 or 11, 13, something like that. And he really wanted to take the sword fighting class. It was taught by a guy who had been one of my former students. Um, he did sword fighting for drama companies and all this kind of stuff. And so we went to the first night. And the first night, after about two hours, they and I could barely move. Okay? Because of everything you're doing with your body, not with the katana. Okay? That's what Taryn feels at this point. So... Dalvin interrupts them, calls what they're doing nonsense, okay? And he takes Taryn back to his hut, building, whatever it's called, and he starts to talk to him about Pridane. He's continuing his education. So the practical part of the education is gone, and we're now back to the impractical part of the education. And he's telling him, what kind of education is this? Talking about the past, right? Mm -hmm. So it's history. history. Talks about Perdain. Okay? He talks about Oran, the Lord of Anuvan. Anuvan, the land of death. So there's another answer to one of your quiz questions. He says Anuvan is more, however, is more than a land of death. It's a treasure house. Wait, how can the land of death also be a treasure house? Because as the novel goes on, and he tells us directly here, what did Iran do a long time ago? We're not told how long. We are told how old Dalbin is, 379 years old. The implication is a lot of what he's talking about here, probably in the 200 to 300 years ago, which is going to be interesting because of what we're told about some other characters as the novels go on. So maybe it wasn't two or three hundred years ago. 
But, he says, long ago, the race of men owned all these treasures. What treasures? Not only gold and jewels, it's page 7, but other things of advantage to men. So other than gold and jewels, what other kind of things can be of advantage to us? Knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Yes. Good ancient answer. Knowledge. Books? What? Oh, I just said ancient knowledge. Right? Ancient knowledge? Knowledge of what? Like magic and stuff. Possibly magic and stuff. History. What else? History? What else? Future. Future? Louder? How about knowledge of planting? You know, we think, you know, dig a furrow in the ground, drop the seeds and cover it up, water it, and it grows. There's older knowledge, though, about planting certain kinds of crops, such as planting on the first full moon and planting at night of that first full moon. That's an idea found in a whole bunch of cultures all around the world. That certain kinds of plants planted in the light of a full moon will do better than seeds sown at one o'clock in the afternoon. It's something about, you know, we have what are called circadian rhythms in our bodies that determine how well we sleep, when it's light, when it's dark, etc. Well, seeds respond similarly. To light and dark. Yes. It could also be the temperature. I mean, sure. seeds could think, you know, it's too hard to live right now, so they're still going to be there. Temperature of the soil, moisture of the soil, at midnight versus noon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's different kinds of knowledge. So he says, by craft and deceit, Iran stole them. That is, he stole not only the gold and gems, but he stole these things that were advantageous to humanity. One by one for his own evil use. Some few of the treasures have been wrested from him, though most lie hidden deep in the Nunavut. Okay? Taryn says, yeah, but he never became leader. He didn't become ruler of Pradane. He says, no, he didn't. Why didn't he? Well, more history. We find out about the children of Don, the sons of the Lady Don and her consort, husband, Bilin, king of the sun. King of the sun kind of implies what? God. Yeah, possibly. Or at the very least, the first king. we're not in Kansas anymore. Where, where, where does this lady Dawn and Balin, son, uh, king of the sun, where do they come from? Somewhere else. So when you look at this map, Here's Pradane. Notice it sticks out kind of as a promontory. All the black here is water. Well, where, where did they come from? They came from what's not on the page. They came from over here. They sailed to this land, we're told, and what did they do? They left the summer country. Just the very name, summer country, implies what about it? It's a country. What else? Always <clears throat> summer. It's always summer. If you've ever, ever read C.S. Lewis's Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, when the little Pevensey children arrive in Narnia, Narnia is what at that point? Winter. It's always winter. Okay. They found the land rich and fair, though the race of men had little for themselves. They built their stronghold, and from there they helped regain at least a portion of what Iran had stolen. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, Dalvin goes on and says, that's all good, but it led to a problem. What's the problem? Top of page eight, bottom of seven, top of eight. The men of Pradain came to rely on the strength of the house of Don as a child clings to its mother. Well, why does a child cling to its mother? Safety. Safety, protection. And we could go straight from here. Tolkien's talk about applicability and allegory, um, and, and talk about applicability and extrapolate from this to the real world. 
What happened after World War II in Europe? Germany gets divided, right? Occupied by Russia and, you know, the Western powers and such. And then what happens? You get the Iron Curtain, so to speak. The Eastern, what are called the Eastern Bloc countries, become the Eastern Bloc countries. Why? Because the Soviet Union invades and occupies and all that kind of stuff. Well, what stops the Soviet Union from coming over the rest of the way? What little group begins, starts as a little group, in the late 40s, very early 50s, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. But who makes up NATO? Us, at the time, us, France, Britain, Iceland, woo, Norway, <laughs> Denmark, Sweden, you know, woo, big. Who makes up Norway? Uh, Norway. NATO. <laughs> the United States. It wasn't Britain keeping Soviet Union at bay. It was us. Okay? So the same kind of thing. Why can France spend so much money on social problems? Why can people in France have 30-hour full, full-time, 30-hour work weeks and state mandated? I think it is six weeks vacation. Because they're not paying for their national defense. The Sons of Dawn are the, the United States, so to speak. Okay? So what's Dalvin's point? The people have gotten a little bit lazy by relying on the Sons of Dawn. They do so even today. Math, the High King, <coughs> is descended from the House of Dawn, so is Prince Gwydion. But, but that's all by the by, meaning that's all kind of old history. Pridane's been at peace until now. Until now, not much longer. And he goes on and he talks about the Horned King. Okay. He says, I don't know who's behind the Horned King, but I think it's Ron, etc. Well, how did the novel open? What's Terran want? He wants a sword. Now he has an object for his sword. The reason Alexander does it this way is he's creating a nemesis of sorts, an adversary. Is, is Terran really the adversary, however, of the Horn King? No. How old is Terran? How old? Any idea? 12? I guess like 18. He's not a man. Dalvin says, you're not yet a man. And you have some foolish ideas of what it is to be a hero. So I don't, I think 18's too old. I was thinking like 15. 11's probably too young. He's somewhere between probably 12 and 16. Because we are going to be told he's strong. Well, he works on a farm. He's going to be strong. Okay. So, Terrence says, bottom of page 8. When Dalvin says, you not to leave Kira Dalvin under any circumstances. You understand? You stay here. Why? Because the Horned King might be just outside our property. I mean, that's the implication. Terran, oh, you convinced me. For the time being. Always told to stay home. What's he really want? He wants to get out of there. How many of you... You don't have to answer this. It's rhetorical. How many of you could not wait to get away from home? That's what that's what Taryn is. He needs to find himself. He needs to prove himself, etc. Dalvin, there are worse things. Worse things than what? Taryn says, I think it will always be for the time being. And it will be vegetables and horseshoes all my life. I'll spend my life doing nothing but digging vegetables, potatoes, and turnips are what I talked about, and making horseshoes. Dalvin, there are worse things. Well, what are some worse things than vegetables and horseshoes? Dying. Dying, that's, a, that's one. <laughs> How about not having any vegetables, <laughs> meaning any food? Okay. You set yourself to be a glorious hero? You believe it's all ooh, flashing swords, galloping about on horses? Terrible. 
What about Gideon? He's a glorious hero. Yeah, I want to be like him. It's not going to happen, kid. Notice what Dalvin's doing here. You will never be a hero. Just put the idea out of your mind. What happens when somebody in authority tells those beneath them, you know, don't read book X. Yeah, you go out and buy it, you know. You might not have had any interest in it before, but that's what you're going to read. Okay? You can't do this. What is that? That's a challenge. You want to, okay. Is this reverse psychology? Is this Dalvin saying, come on. <laughs> in some cases, we learn, Terrence says, I know if I had the chance, Dalvin interrupts him. Why? In some cases, we learn more by looking for the answer to a question and not finding it than we do from learning the answer itself. What? We learn more from looking for the answer to a question and not finding it than we do from learning the answer itself. How do you, how do you learn more from that? It's the journey, not the destination. Okay, that's the platitudinal answer that's often given, but what does that really mean? Oh, I'm pretty sure this is wrong, but like, you know, in science, it, it's still a good thing to know the wrong answer because then that might lead you to the right answer. At least you're not going to go down that same path. The scientific method, what do you do first? You come up with a hypothesis, and then you do what? You design an experiment to prove the hypothesis. And what happens if you prove the hypothesis is wrong? Well, that's a discovery in and of itself. Okay? That's what he means. But he, I mean, take the science thing out of it. What else does it mean? Taryn's going to meet Gwydion very shortly. And Gwydion's going to ask him. Um, in fact, let's just go there. Chapter 2. Henwin gets out. Taryn goes off after her. Because he's been commanded. Watch Henwin. Henwin gets out. He goes off into the you know wild yonder. And in trying to chase her down, he runs into nearly, I mean almost literally into, the Horn King and his troops, but he's not caught. And then in chapter 2, pages 16 and 17. He runs into a warrior. And this, this, guy, this guy is described, page 16. Shaggy, gray streaked hair of a wolf. Not meaning he's literally wearing wolf skin on him, but he's salt and pepper hair. Eyes are deep set, flecked with green. Sun and wind had leathered his broad face, burnt it dark, craned it with fine lines. Okay, now that can be a sexy description, but what else can it be? This guy looks old. He looks withered. I don't know if you've seen people who spent too many hours in a tanning bed. They come out looking like my belt. Okay, just like you don't want to touch that skin. Why does he look this way? He's war born. Okay. Why else? He's been battle for a while. Where does he live? Outside. He doesn't live in a fine palace. This isn't Prince Charming of, you know, Snow White and stuff, okay? We're told. What else? His cloak was coarse and travel-stained. A wide belt with an intricately wrought buckle circled his waist. So he gives to Terrence his drink. You look as though you thought I was trying to poison you. It's not thus that Gwydion, son of Don, deals with a wounded. Okay, he's telling him, I, I am Gwydion. Terrence, you're not Gwydion. I know of him. Notice he doesn't say, I know him. I know of him. How does he know of him? He heard about him. I've heard stories. And so Gwydion kind of goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> he is a great war leader, a hero. He's not. And Taryn's kind of, you know, taking the whole package in. 
And then he sees the big sword at his belt. A golden pommel, smooth, rounded, ash leaves of pale gold entwined at the hilt, pattern of leaves. That's the sword of a prince. And he drops to a knee. Lord. <laughs> I did not intend insolence. And if Albus Dumbledore were replying, he would say, but all too often, insolence is what comes out of our mouths anyways. We don't intend it, but you're still an insolent ass. Anyways, so uh, Gwydion helps him up. And Terrence still, page 17, stares in disbelief. We're going to go a lot quicker, believe me. <laughs> 17 pages in 43 minutes. <laughs> Terrence still stared in disbelief. At the simple attire, the worn line face. From all Dalvin had told him of this glorious hero, look at the next clause. From all he had pictured to himself. Where does he get his image of Gwydion? His imagination. His imagination. Did Dalvin say, oh man, he's good. He is good. <laughs> Finest looking man you'll ever see. You know? <laughs> no. Did he say his skin smooth as a baby's back? You know, no lines, no wrinkles. It's like, you know, he bathes in noxema or something. His hair, it's like he's done up every morning. Nope. Taryn creates the image. And what kind of image is it? Superficial. Superficial. What else? Idolized. Bingo. He creates an idol. What happens to the idols we create? They disappoint. They always fail us. Look at your favorite Hollywood actors, actresses, after all the Me Too stuff, you know. People that others held up and, you know, revered. Kevin Spacey. Ooh. Keep them away from your sons, you know. Louis C.K., keep them away from, well, everybody, you know. <laughs> Gwydion, he notices what's going on in Taryn's mind. It's not the trappings that make the prince. In other words, first lesson for you, kid, look a little deeper than just the surface appearance nor indeed the sword. Because Taryn says, oh, that's the sword of a prince. It's got to be the prince. Well, he knows it's the prince because it is not thus that Gwydion, son of Don, treats the wounded. Okay? So Taryn bursts out. He saw the horned prince. They talk about that for a while. And they keep talking. Gwydion says, you know, I'm... I'm trying to track him down, blah, 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 blah. Page 18, Taryn says, I would not fear him. That is, I wouldn't fear to meet the Horn Prince again, Horn King again. And Didion, Gideon, blah, blah, blah. Gwydion says, then you're a fool. He is the man most to be dreaded in all Perdain. Well, why does Taryn say he wouldn't fear him? He wants to sound brave. He wants to sound brave. Okay. So Gwydion goes on and tells him what Iran promises kings of the land. He promises them wealth, he promises them power, he promises them various other things. So they decide they're going to have to go together for a while. Their path will be shared. The way Gwydion puts it, page 20. Terence says, I won't slow you down. I won't hinder you. Let me come, let me come. It would seem Taryn of Kiradalbin, right smack in the middle of page 20. It would seem, Taryn of Caradalbin, we follow the same path, for a little while at least. Notice what that implies. Where is the path? It's not one they're creating. It's one that's already kind of set out for them. That you know, Gwydion found his way on it, and Taryn found his way on it, and they're walking on them together, and Taryn's way might at some point in the future veer off, and Gwydion might. So Gwydion asked him, page 21,
they're getting ready for bed and stuff. Great Angel Gum just lay down on the ground. And Tara's like, he's a prince. He sleeps on the ground. Like, what did he expect? You know, blow up air mattress or... Sorry, I just had a question. I sure. remember when I was reading, there was this, I'm, and I don't know how to say it, I don't remember what I, exactly, but when he was talking to him, right like in the same part, he asked him, he said basically like, uh, basically saying, I think you'll assist me, or maybe I'll assist you. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that in just a second. I, nope. I, I, That's where we're leading to. My bad. So, Terrence bunked down. Gwydion is taking the first watch. And he asked Terry, page 21, how long have you been with Dalvin? How long have you lived with Dalvin at Terra Dalvin? Who are your kinsmen? And that's when Taryn, leaning up against the tree, says, I don't think I have any kinsmen. Now, what does that mean, literally? I'm alone in the world. I have no family. I don't know who my parents were. Dalvin has never told me. I suppose. And he turns his face away. He doesn't want to look at Gwydion when he says this. I don't even know who I am. Why does he turn away? Shame. Bingo. He's ashamed. So Gwydion responds how? Ah, suck it up, kid. Make a name for you. No. In a way, that is something we must all discover for ourselves. Yeah, but, you know, Gwydion doesn't have to find out who he's from, right? His father's the High King. He descends from Lady Dawn and the Sun King, you know. In a way, that's something we must all discover for ourselves. How? How many of you already have a declared major? You're, you're firm with it. You're dead sure that's what you're going to do, and you're going to stay with that for the remainder of your college career. And then you're going to graduate, and that's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Yeah, the hands start to drop a little bit. Some of you, your hands are still kind of up. None of you are, you know, you're reaching for the sky. You're, you're all kind of a little wimpy, like, eh, I'm pretty sure. We have to discover who we are. How? By doing. By doing. Our meeting was fortunate. Thanks to you, I know a little more than I did. And you have spared me a wasted journey to Care Dalvin. In other words, I can stop right here. I don't have to go from here all the way to Dalvin and say, Dalvin, <laughs> do you know anything? Because you just told me what he knows. It makes me wonder, is there a destiny laid on me that an assistant pig keeper should help me in my quest? Is there a destiny? Is it preordained? Has God said, Gwydion, this pig keeper is going to help you? Prince, lowly pig keeper. And then he hesitates. He pauses. Or... Is it perhaps the other way around? Okay, so what would the other way around be? Or is there a destiny on me that I should help an assistant pig keeper in his quest? Well, if it's that, what's his quest? What's Terrence's quest? Is it to be a hero? He thinks he wants to be a hero. He thinks that's what he's supposed to be. Or is it, as somebody said, to find himself, to find out who he is. Because, let's go back again to his possible age, 12 to 15 or 16. How many 12 to 16 year olds have everything planned out? How many 12 to 16 year olds really know who they are? They don't. That's why they go through so many problems. <laughs> They're doing what? How? Trial and, Trial and error. They push the envelope this way, and sometimes it breaks and they go through, and sometimes it smacks them back. They make a mistake. They go, ouch, that's not going that way. They 
try various things. You know, if they're in high school, they join various clubs. They do, you know, maybe I'm good at this, maybe I'm good at this, maybe I'm good at this, blah, 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 blah. For some people, it doesn't end at 16. It goes into their 20s or into their 30s. And they just keep trying different things, okay? Karen, what do you mean? In other words, whoosh, <laughs> straight over his head. He doesn't have a clue what Gwydion meant by that. He goes, oh, I'm not sure. Get some sleep. Okay? So, next chapter, talking about Gurgi. Gwydion talks about when Hinwin, long ago, was a captive in Anuvan. Long, I don't know about you, but long ago implies what? Okay, I'm 57. Long ago could be 30 years ago. None of you guys are 30 yet. I don't think. If you are, you sure don't look it. But I don't think 30 is long ago. I think long ago is like 100 years ago. That's kind of getting there. 300, that's long ago. How old is this damn pig? If the pig was in a Newman long ago. Which is this mystical and magical as they're saying. Okay. Was Hen in Anubin? But but how? Long ago. Henwin lived among the race of men. She belonged to a farmer who had no idea at all of her powers. Okay? Skip a little bit. She was captured. Page 24. A warrior went alone into the depths of Anubin. That is, a warrior went into hell, essentially, and brought her back. He said, oh, he's a mighty warrior. It was called. He's bald. <laughs> Page 24. Assistant pig keeper, you have curious notions about heroes. Like, why can't bald guys be heroes? Maybe he's familiar with the story of Samson, you know? Longer the hair, you cut his hair, he loses his strength. I don't think so. Okay? So, they go on, and as they're marching... Karen notices something in the trees above him. And the thing, whatever it is, drops down behind him, grabs him by the throat, and tries to strangle him. Karen throws him off. 26, it's the strangest creature you'd ever seen. It's not a human. Not sure whether it's animal either. Hairy all over. Matted fur. Smells. And Gwydion talks to it like he knows it. Oh, so it's you. And he says, it's Gurgi. He's always looking about one place or another. Not half as ferocious as he looks, nor quarter as fierce as he would like to be. More nuisance than anything else. He manages to see most of what happens. He might be able to help us. What does that mean, he manages to see most of what happens? He's observant. He sees a lot. And what do they hear? Gurgi tells them about the troops. The cauldron born, etc. Okay. Taryn just thinks, page 29, he's a disgusting beast. What a nasty, vicious. And Gwydion says, he's not bad at heart. Well, we could go from there to the end. How not bad at heart is Gurgi? He saves them. He saves them. He, finds he helps find Henwin. He's good at heart. That is, physically, he appears what? Bad. He appears subhuman. In his heart, he's what? He's better than most humans. Okay. What trait is he going to show to Terran? He is going to be loyal to him. In fact, from this book on, he's like Terran's shadow. He's not going to leave him behind. Why? Because Taryn's going to feed him? Yeah, a little bit of that. <laughs> He's going to protect him. Okay? So, chapter four. The Gwythanes. Let's see here. The Gwythanes see them. And what are the Gwythanes? Raven. They're the bird, big raven slash eagle like birds that have 
nail-like talons that attack and eat whatever they catch. Family member rushed to the hospital. Um, okay, where were we? So the Grithanes. They see that the Grith, Grith but I can never say that word. The Grithanes see them, and that because they're spies for Iran and the Horn King, they'll reveal their place. Okay? So they're trying to stay hidden and keep away from them. Pages 34 and 35. Taryn says, and who wouldn't? Who wouldn't say exactly what he says? If only they hadn't seen us. It's like, damn, if only that cop hadn't been there. <laughs> <laughs> if only I wasn't doing 75 in a 45 mile an hour zone. If only, if only, if only, if only. There is no use regretting what has happened. Well, it seems like, duh, basic wisdom, but it's pretty deep when you think about it. Because what do we often do? We regret the past. We can't do anything about the past. We can't do anything literally about the future either, can we? Because the future doesn't exist. What exists right now, that's what we can do something about. Okay? One way or another, Gwynian says, Iran would have learned this. In other words, kid, open your eyes. The odds are against us here. Okay? So he goes on and he talks about the cauldron born. And Karen says, well, aren't they men? Well, they were. They're zombies. Eh, little. These cauldron born, page 35 are utterly without mercy or pity. For Iran has worked still greater evil upon them. He has destroyed their remembrance of themselves as living men. They have no memory of tears or laughter, of sorrow or loving kindness. Among all Iran's deeds, this is one of the cruelest. So, no memory of tears or laughter, of sorrow or of love. What's essentially become to them? Or what has happened to them? They've been out of submission to kill stuff, new orders, robots. They're no longer human. They're human form. They have no will. They have no choice. They have no compassion. Gurgi even has compassion. He's not even human. Okay? You think it is. It, later on it says that... Um, not even a sword can harm them. So are they even... They can't be killed. Yeah. So are they even alive? Uh, they're alive as long as the cauldron exists. Okay? Second book. <laughs> Class foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay? So, um, let's see here. They keep going on, page 37, bottom of 36, top of 37. They hear a noise in middle of 37. Taryn wakes up because he hears Melangar, Gwydion's horse, whinnying. Gwydion goes to her. Taryn 
sees a shadow in a bush and we're told, choking back his fear, Karen leaped to his feet, plunged into the undergrowth. Thorns tore at him. He landed on something that grappled frantically. He lashed out and it turned out to be Gurdy. Okay. Gwydion's like, you know, you're going to scare him to death. Save yourself your own life next time. I should have known a great war leader needs no help from an assistant pig keeper. Gwydion replies, I scorn the help of no man. But save your anger for a better purpose. In other words, why are you beating up Gurgi? What's Gurgi done to you? And then Gwydion realizes, you really thought you were saving my life. You did think my life was in danger. If I'd only known it was that stupid silly, he goes, but you didn't. What's Taryn just shown? Bravery. 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 Courage. What else? Compassion. Compassion. Loyalty. 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 Whose life was more important, his or Gwydion's? Gwydion's. Taryn shows he's willing to sacrifice himself for Gwydion. Fact is, you did not. So I shall take the intention for the deed. That is, you didn't save my life because it was just Gurdy. I was never in danger. But you intended to. So I'm going to take it as though you tackled the Horn King. You may be many other things, Terran Kerdalbin, but you're no coward. Thank you. And he bows to him. Okay. And Gurgi, you know, what about me? What about me? <laughs> okay, so the broken sword chapter. Let's see here. Uh, um, thank you, by the way. Um, they get captured. They get taken to the spiral castle. And we meet Akron, the sorceress, the enchantress. And, you know, Karen doesn't know anything about her, so she asks him questions, and he starts answering. Until Dalvin told him, uh, until Gwydion tells him to shut up. Okay? So she locks him in, pri in prison. We're going to skip a bit. Go on to chapter 6. So Terran's down there. He's in the dungeon in his little cell with a grate up above. And a stupid girl comes in. And she's, you know, like singing some stupid little song. And she's playing with a little gold-like ball that she drops through the grate. And he calls her little girl, page 51. I'm not a little girl. Haven't I just been and finished telling you? Are you slow-witted? I'm so sorry for you. It's terrible. It's terrible to be <laughs> dull and stupid. What's your name? It makes me feel funny not knowing someone's name. Wrong-footed, you know, as if I had three thumbs on one hand. Wrong-footed, three thumbs on one hand. She mixes up a lot of her uh, analogies, metaphors. I lost my place. So, Taryn tells her, her name, his name. He says what his job is. He's an assistant pig keeper. And she says, really? You know, that's cool. There's somebody else. Who does Taryn assume it is? Gwydion. But, turns out not to be. Taryn finds out this girl, whose name is Ilanwi, she tells him who her parents are, or excuse me, who her, what her history is, 54 and 55. I am Ilanwi, daughter of Angarad, daughter of Regat, daughter of, oh, I am of the blood of Lear, half speech, the sea king. If you've ever heard the name King Lear, played by Shakespeare, it's the same Lear. Lear is a famous character in Celtic mythology. Okay? So she's saying, I come from that family. This is a, a, uh, an island people off the coast of Prydain. All right? So if she's the daughter, da 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 daughter of a king, What's that make her? She's a princess. Okay. So what are you doing here? Well, I live here. She's being taught, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're going to skip some. Go on to chapter seven. Um, she helps him get out. She says, "I took Melangar from the stable. Your companion is free. They're waiting for you. So let's get a move on." Taryn says, "But Ocran's going to know you've escaped." She says, no, she won't. She'll think I'm still locked up. She doesn't know I can get out, so she won't know I was here. So Taryn follows her. 
And the alarm is kind of sounded, bottom of 63. And he tells her to go on, top of 64. And, and what do you intend doing? You can't just sit there. It doesn't make any difference about me. You can find a rope and come back when things are safe. Save yourself. Don't worry about me. Again, he's willing to sacrifice. Okay? So they go into another hole, and she calls them names and such. And such. Um, chapter 8. Like I said, we're trying to go through this quickly. They come to a barrow. Well, what's a barrow? It's a burial mound. Go to Stonehenge. Take a course in London sometime. Take one of, you know, there are multiple courses offered in, in London every summer um, through CCSA. Take a course. I used to teach Harry Potter courses over there. Take a course and go to Stonehenge. Look at the pretty big rocks and then turn your back to the rocks. And look out away from Stonehenge. And you will see a couple of dozen big mounds that look like that off in the distance. They're all burial mounds. Something or somebody several thousand years ago, or a couple at least, was buried here. And then they put a big old pile of dirt on top of them. Okay? Some of these mounds in the eastern part of England, at least, that aren't several thousand years old, but 1,500 years old, had boats in them. In fact, some have just recently been discovered again in Norway and Sweden. Okay? The Vikings did this. So they go into this barrel, and what do they find? There's a dead guy lying in his coffin, and, you know, in his hands, on his chest, is a big old sword. Page 71. Surely it is the barrow of the king who built this castle, Terran says. Does he know that to be true? No, he's just, you know, blah, 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 trying to sound smart. He steps past the warriors, draws near the figure on the slab. Rich raiment clothed the body, polished stones, clawed hands still grasped the jeweled hilt of the sword, as if ready to unsheathe it. Terran recoils. Skull grimaces and such. Okay. So they keep going on. Page 72. Ilanwi says she's all tangled up with the sword. The scabbard's caught on something. What sword? The sword that the, the dead guy had. And in a violent explosion that seemed ripped from the very center of the earth, Spiral Castle crumbled in on itself. It imploded. She says, thank you for saving my life, for an assistant pig keeper, you're quite courageous, etc., etc." So, Taryn thinks he's going to be meeting up with Gwydion. Who does he meet instead? Fluter Flam. Okay, so let's, so we have Paul, Taryn, Dolvin. That's all at Care Dolphin. That's at Care Dolphin. And then we meet, as we go along, Gwydion, Gurgi, Ilan, we, that's a W. Fluder, two Fs? Yep. Fluder Fam. Okay. The D D is probably pronounced v -v -v Fluter, Fluter Flam. Okay. So he meets up with Fluter, says, "You're not Gwydion." He says, "I know I'm not. Never claimed I was." Page seventy-five. Fluter tells him who he is. I am Fluter Flam, son of Godo. He's a bard. I've got a harp and everything. What else are we going to find out about Fluter? He's a king. Does he look like a king? Does he act like a king? I mean, if Gwydion's a prince, then what should a king be? Gwydion on steroids. <laughs> it's not Fluter. Okay? He's, is he a liar? No. He's not a truther. Let's be precise with words. 
Bingo! He's an embellisher. He's a storyteller. He's not a historian. Historians, supposedly, tell the truth. Storytellers tell stories. Stories are never true. Never. This is not true. Why? There never was a real boy named Taryn of Caradolgan. That's a lie. It's just a beautiful lie, okay? So, Fluter says, Gwydion is dead, in response to what Taryn says. And that's horrible, blah, 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 blah. Taryn, they go on what they're going to do. Taryn says, I'm going to seek Gwydion alone. They're like, you don't have to seek him alone. Okay. Bottom of page 80 and 81. Gurgi shows up again. And Alonwi says, boy, you keep strange company, which is kind of interesting because who's in his company right now? Uh, that would be Alonwi and Fluter. What is this thing? He says, he's no friend of mine. He's a miserable, sneaking wretch who deserted us as soon as we were attacked. On what basis does Taryn say that? What basis in fact? How does he know that to be true? He ran off when the fight started. Did he? Or did he just not get caught? See, Taryn assumes that. Gurgi says, no, no, no. I am humble. I am faithful to mighty lords. Tell, tell the truth. You ran off when we needed you most. Slashings and gnashings, slashings and gashings, sorry, are for noble lords, not for poor, weak Gurgi. Fearsome whistlings of blades. Gurgi ran to look for help. Gurgi tells us, I went to look for help. Taryn says, you ran away. Perspective? I'm not taking sides. You didn't succeed in finding any, says Taryn. Not my fault, you know. What else can unhappy Gurgi do? He is sorry to see great warriors in distress, or tears of misery, but in battle, in battle, what would there be for poor Gurgi except hurtful guttings and cuttings of his throat? In other words, what can I do? I don't have a sword. I don't have a hammer. I don't have a stick. I don't have a... Alonwi says, well, it wasn't brave, but it wasn't stupid either. Right? So, what did Gwydion say about Gurgi earlier? He's observant. He sees everything. What do we hear on page 82? I know where they are. Not Gwydion, but the cauldron born. Many more hosts march in the valley with sharp spears. Many, many more. The enemies of the House of Dawn, Taryn says, are gathering. Gwydion and I saw them before we were captured. Now if Gurgi speaks the truth, they have gathered reinforcements. That is, the cauldron born. So now they've got to decide, what are they going to do? Well, what was Gwydion going to do before he was captured? He was no longer going to go to Caradolvin, right? Was he going to go find the Horn King, you know, single combat, David and Goliath kind of thing? No. What was he going to do? Caradaffle? He was going to go back home and tell his father what he discovered, and then they would send a rescue party, uh, gather more troops, try to find... Henwin, chapter 10. The sword, Dernwin. And the reason everything spelled weird is because it's Welsh, or looks Welsh. Okay? Um, so they start talking about this sword that Ilanwi stole from the dead guy, and it's got old writing on the scabbard and such. They're trying to figure out whose it is, what it is, etc. And she can kind of read it. Page 86. Draw Dernwin, only thou of royal blood, to rule, to strike thee. Eh, I can't read the rest. Okay. So Terence says, here, give it to me. Let me unsheath it. Well, what's it say? Draw, only thou of royal blood. She says, no, only royal blood. Doesn't say anything about assistant pig keepers. 
well, how do you know I don't have royal blood? Uh, assistant big keeper. <laughs> when was the last time you saw Prince Harry or Prince William, you know, slopping pigs? <laughs> I wasn't born an assistant pig keeper, Terrence says, page 87. For all you know, my father might have been a king. Happens all the time in the Book of Three. No. We only have Taryn's word for that to be true. Because we haven't read the Book of Three, have we? Uh, I never heard of the Book of Three, she says. But in the first place, I don't think it's good enough to be a king's son or even a king himself. Royal blood's just a way of translating. Ah, okay. So now she's getting it. When you translate something, you have to get the meaning, not just the exact word. In the old writing, it didn't mean only every royal relative. Anybody can have those. It meant, let's see, what is she? I don't know what you'd call it. it. Seems to me if you have it, you don't need to wonder whether you have it. Taryn said to Gwydion what? I don't really know who I am. Well, it seems to me if you have it, royal something, you wouldn't wonder. Karen, oh, so what you mean is I'm not whatever it is. I don't mean to offend you, but as a pig keeper, I think you're quite remarkable. Notice, every time she kind of praises him, she always praises him how? For an assistant pig keeper. And if she met somebody who was a, you know, I don't know, worked at a gas station, for a gas station attendant, it would always be qualified. I even think you're the nicest person I've ever met in my life. It's just that I'm forbidden to let you have the sword, and that's that. So what are you going to do with it? I'm going to keep it. Okay. So they continue talking. They find out a little bit more about Fluter. What kind of bard is he? Not a very good one. Okay. He's actually not a fully-fledged bard. He hasn't passed his exams. And Arlonry mentions about his strings, because he mentions, he calls his strings the beastly strings, bottom 89. She says, you know, they do seem to break quite often. Yeah. I'm kind of emotional. I, I, I get carried away. I might uh, readjust the facts slightly, purely for dramatic effect. You understand. Arlonry, okay, so if you just stop readjusting the facts, perhaps you wouldn't have that trouble with the harp. Yeah, I guess so. So what purpose does the harp serve? Keep him honest. Keep him honest. We're going to be told in a later novel that that's the exact reason it was given to him. To keep him honest. That is, he can sway a little bit. He can go off the road a little bit. And he comes back. It serves as guide rails for him. All right? He says, why does he embellish? As a king, you get into the habit. Top of page 90. What does it mean, as a king? Well, who's going to tell the king the king's lying? <laughs> Not many people. Okay. So, they go on, and Taryn says, bottom of that page, somebody needs to tell the sons of Don what's going on, what's happening. Gwydion and Kent, so <clears throat> I'm going to do it. Page 91. I shall journey to Caradathel myself. I do not question your valor. I'm talking to Fluter. Danger is too great. I ask no one to face it in my stead. What about your pig? Terrence says, my own quest must be given up. His job is to find Henwin. He's saying, that's not as important now. All of Pradane is more important. And notice, I can't ask you to come with me. What if they want to? Is he saying, no, no, you can't? This is my quest. You've got to go find your own. He says, until then, I serve only Gwydion. It was I who cost him his life. It's my fault he's dead. It's justice for me to do to do what I believe he would have done. Okay? 
So they make their way through the hills. Page 96. If you need to get up and leave, feel free to. Do come back, though. Um, page 96, top of the page. They're making their way, and Karen's thinking. And Karen Dalvin, he had dreamed of being a hero. The dreaming, he had come to learn, was easy. Fantasies are great, right? Dreams are wonderful until you wake up. And you go, no, no. Dreaming, he had come to learn, was easy. And that Kara Dalbin, no lives depended on his judgment. He longed for Gwydion's strength and guidance. His own strength, he feared, was not equal to his task. Why? Because these other two are now saying they're going to go with him. By his saying, I'm going to Caradathel, and they're saying, we're going with you, he automatically becomes the leader. And now, their lives depend upon him. Not like a dream anymore. Okay? So they make their way. The cauldron-born start chasing them. Let's see here. Uh, we're going to skip a bunch. Chapter 12, the wolves. Um, bottom of 107. So the cauldron board still haven't caught up to them. Wolves are nearby. And Taryn says, in the middle of 107. At first I thought I would be able to reach Cairdathel by myself. I see now I wouldn't have got even this far without help. It's a good destiny that brings me such brave companions. Why did he think he'd be able to reach Cairdathel by himself? It's part and parcel of his idea of what a hero is. A hero does what? Acts on him, his own will, as it were. What's Taryn learned? Same kind of lesson if you've read the Lord of the Rings. Frodo learns. He needs others. Same lesson Harry Potter learns. In fact, Albus Dumbledore is going to tell Harry, Harry, you need your friends. Tell them what's going on. Okay? There's a reason why it's the fellowship of the ring. Because if it were Frodo, by himself, leaving his door to take the ring to Mordor, he probably wouldn't get out of Hobbiton alive. Okay? Taryn learns the same lesson. I need others. I love you. There you've done it again. It's all you care about. Someone to help you carry spears and swords. It could be anybody, and you'd be just as pleased. Taryn of Caradalbin, I'm not... She takes what he's saying to mean. It doesn't matter who I have with me, just as long as I have somebody with me. Is that what Taryn meant? No! Taryn. Speaking to himself. At home, nothing ever happened. That's why he wanted to make a sword. He wanted something to happen. Now everything happens. That is, at home, potatoes and horseshoes, day in, day out. Now, every little thing I do is what? Life or death. There, there was no death. I mean, cow died every now and then. Chicken, you know, dinner. <laughs> but somehow, I can never seem to make it come out right. Now, everything happens, and I do what? I screw it up. Karen thinks he doesn't do anything right. We're at page 107. He's still alive. Gwydion said, previous page that I didn't point out, before he disappears, Um, 
page 36. Terence says, if we could only find England, we should have only a faint hope. But that is better than none at all. There's a phrase, a saying, where there's life, there's hope. Well, they're still alive. And yet Terence, you know, seemingly thinking he's just going to fail totally. They keep going on. Chapter 13. They come into what's called the Hidden Valley. Straight out of Welsh mythology. It's also out of Christian mythology, right? Because what is this place? It's kind of like Eden. Kind of like the Ark. Okay? They meet Medwin, or Meduin. It's pronounced one of those two ways. The guy who lives there. I'm not going to say the owner, because he doesn't own what's there. And there's flowers and vegetables and all this kind of stuff. In page 119, I'm going to say Meduin. Meduin says, every living thing deserves our respect. Every living thing. Cauldron born? Are they living? Hmm. Well, what does that include? The Gwythaints. Be it humble or proud, ugly or beautiful. And I don't know, maybe Alon we sitting off to the side and she's a looker. And there's Gertie. So humble and ugly, proud and beautiful, you know. I wouldn't want to say that about the Gwythaints, Terrence says. In other words, come on, old man. Have you met a Gwythaint? Really? I feel only sorrow for those unhappy creatures. And he tells us what they were. Once they were normal birds. And Aran lured them to him, and he twisted them, and he turned them, and he ruined them. And there's a lot of parallels, by the way, if you've read The Lord of the Rings, because the Gwythaints are kind of like orcs. In the Lord of the Rings, what were orcs originally? You got to go back to the writings that become Silmarillion or the history of Middle Earth. They were elves. That Morgoth and then later Sauron took and twisted and inbred and then bred with other things. So that now they're the exact opposite of elves. Rather than beings of light and joy and beauty and hope, they're beings of darkness and sorrow and despair and ugliness. So, now they serve him out of terror. Thus would he strive to corrupt every animal, etc., etc. Okay? Terrence says, maybe Gurgi should stay here. He'd be safer. Medwin says, yeah, he would. Gurgi's misfortune that he is neither one thing nor the other. He's neither... He's neither human nor beast. In what's called, term from the 17th century, the great chain of being, that is, everything that is created, notice the, the line here, there's a huge chasm or gulf separating God from everything else, right? Everything that's created from the highest order of the angelic beings, if you accept the stories of, of angels, down to the lowest, if we're talking about living stuff, single cell organism, but if we're not talking about living stuff, we're just talking about stuff, the smallest particle of reality, the top to the bottom, everything exists in a chain. You know, right? Like this. We're all a link in this chain. So you have humans, and right beneath humans are beasts and animals. Notice where humans are, though. Humans are between beasts and animals and angels. Why? 
so that Shakespeare and other writers can say that we should appeal to our better angels, the good parts of us, and not to our animal characteristics, the lower parts. I mean, these are the Jeffrey Dahmers. Do you know who Jeffrey Dahmer was? He was a mass murderer who ate what he killed. <laughs> Pretty beast-like. And this is, you know, Mother Teresa, who did just the opposite. She went around and fed the despised outcast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay? So he says, Gurney's problem. He doesn't know what he is. Or should be. He is neither one or the other. At the moment. What does that mean, at the moment? Maybe Gurky represents humanity in the evolutionary scale before this. Because he's obviously not like a bear, right? What can Gurky do that most bears can't? I mean, Yogi, okay, he can talk, <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, he can talk, think, okay, rational, somewhat. He even philosophizes a little bit, okay? Bears think food, danger. He's lost the wisdom of animals, so he's risen above that. And not gain the learning of men. But he's beneath humanity. Therefore, both shun him. Were he to do something pur purposeful, it would mean much to him. Don't worry about Gurgi. He's not going to slow you down. Neither refuse to give help when it is needed, Medway says. Nor refuse to accept it when it's offered. Guthrie, son of Gredal, learned that from a lame inn. And he goes on and he tells the story. Okay? Mid-page 121, he goes on. I've studied the race of men. I've seen that alone, you stand as you. He doesn't say we. You. What's the implication? I'm not one of you. I'm a little different than you guys. You stand as weak reeds by a lake. You must learn to help yourselves. That's true. But you must also learn to help one another. Are you not all of you lame ants? That is, each one of you is lame. What do you need when you are lame? Bill Withers song from the 1960s. Lean on me when you're not strong. Okay. One of the best songs of the 60s. So, Darren's silent. He says, what is this all of a sudden? Why? Because he suddenly realizes, I'm mean, just not talking to some old guy. <laughs> this guy's a little different than that. It's a place of peace, therefore not suitable for men. In other words, you can't stay. I hold this valley for creatures of the forest and the waters, etc., etc. Dalvin talks, you know, Terrence says, I heard about the flood. Okay. Who, who, who are you? I am Medellin. I am the one. My own concern is for Hinwin. You you don't haven't seen her? Nope. Okay. So they eat. And page 124. Terrence says, There are times when I fear I shall not see Caragalbin again. Remember, as we opened, he wanted what? To leave. He wanted nothing more to get out of here. Man, he was tired of being there. It's not given to men to know the ends of their journeys. Why not? Why don't you get, when you were born, a certificate that says Theodore James Sherman, born January 19, 1962, dead. April 15th, when your millennium is 2000. 2045. That's what, 26 years from now? Yeah, it'd be okay. <laughs> I don't want to go much past 80 or so. Man. So why don't we get that? Why not? Okay. True. <laughs> not the theory. If it did, why shouldn't we know how our end comes? Because we won't live. 
What do you mean we won't go? We won't, if we know when we're going to die, why is there a point? We won't go and experience things. Okay, that's one argument. We'll try to cheat death. Bingo! We'll try to change it. Old Greek tale of Oedipus. Oedipus is a man. His father is a king. His father's throwing a party. Some drunk stands up and goes, Oedipus, you're a son of incest, you know, or something like that. You're going to kill your father and marry your mother. He's like, really? Get out of here. And so he, you know, that just bothers him. He goes to his parents. They say, no, 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 don't worry about it. He's a drunk. He finally, he's got to, he, he needs closure on this. He goes to an oracle. And the oracle says, oracle of Delphi, the voice of God, so to speak, says, you are damned to kill your father, marry your mother, and bring into the world a brood of children who should never see the light of day. And he's like, hell no. Ain't going to happen to me. You're in his shoes. What do you do? The very next day, or maybe that moment, leave home. Leave home. And don't call. Yeah. <laughs> just, just go as far away from home as you can. Well, that's exactly what he does. And yet, he fulfills the prophecy. Why? Because mom and dad never told him he was adopted. Wow. <laughs> he runs away from home thinking he's saving mom and dad and himself. Okay, just the thought of sleeping with one's mother is weird. <laughs> so he runs away. Okay, so what two things do you never do? If you're prophesied to kill your father and sleep with your mother. Okay, is it that you don't kill anyone? Don't kill any man. Because if I'm prophesied to kill my father, sleep with my mother, I can kill you as much as I want. And <laughs> you, and you. In fact, all you guys. Because none of you are old enough to be my father. I just, you know, I have that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's break down a brass tacks here. I can kill any man who's not old enough to be my father. So, a couple of years older than me. Yep, that's safe. But you start getting, and I would be really conservative here. Ten years older? Yeah, that's where I draw the line. <laughs> Fifteen? Definitely not. You know, roll over and let them pet my belly or whatever. I'm not going to you know, do anything. Women? Sleep with as many and whoever as you want just when they get to be old enough to be your mother. Nope. And he does both. By hearing the prophecy, he attempts to pull an end run around destiny or fate. And in doing so, he causes it to happen. That's one of the reasons why we should never know what our end is, where our end is, because we'll try to stop it. Yes? It's really a little theory I thought about, like, time travel. And you know how people, like, there's always stories about messing up timelines, but they'll somehow just fix themselves, sort of like Nick and Dex did. Yeah. Every writer, every writer who introduces a time travel element into whatever it is they're writing, they always, always, always do what they're writing. Because there is no resolution to the time travel conundrum. And I know in Marvel's Avengers, whatever the last one was, they try to figure a way around it. Uh-uh. It doesn't work. It, it, from what we understand of time, if our understanding is correct, if you enter, go back into that quote-unquote time stream, unless there are, as some physicists suggest, and I shouldn't be talking about this because we don't have time, unless there are multiverses, and each multiverse is a different quote-unquote time stream. Okay? So, it's not given to men to know the ends of their journeys. That maybe you will never return to the place dearest to you. Well, what's the place dearest to him? Now. It wasn't at the beginning. Now it is. Care death. But how can that matter if what you must do is here? 
What does it matter whether or not you go home? Going home isn't what's important right now, right? What's important right now? Saving the world by telling the sons of dawn. Why? Because I'm a kid. I can't save the world. Terry, I think that if I knew I were not to see my own home again, I would be happy to stay in this valley. What's he really mean by that? If I knew I could never go back home, I would be happy to stay here. He wants peace. He wants peace? What else does it mean? Okay. He doesn't have to fight. I'm tired. This has been a hard, long slog so far. If I'm never going to go home again, Shoot me now. That's ultimately, that's really what he's saying. Your heart is young and unformed. It doesn't mean literally unformed. He means what? You don't know what your own strength and courage are. That's why Dalbin said, sometimes you learn more from the process of trying to find the answer to a problem than in the actual location of the answer. Why? Because that's what makes you grow. Your heart is young and informed. But if I read it well, I would welcome you here. Why? You're still good. You're not like that old jaded, you know, bastard Sherman. You know, I wouldn't let him even look at my land. Indeed, you may stay if you choose. What's he just offered? Like a way out? Oh, what kind of way out? Don't think that door. Knock the whole wall. <laughs> you can go. You can have what? Peace. Happiness. Because what is this place? It's like Eden. The animals talk to you. He's Dr. Doolittle for all intents and purposes. <laughs> this is, you know, this would be wonderful. Surely you can give your task to your friends. Fluter, I love, come here. I'm going to stay. You guys go. Well, what happens once they go outside the valley? Horned King, Cauldron Born, Gwithaints, danger. No, no, but I'll stay here. You, you guys go and continue the. No, I've taken it on myself through my own choice. Okay, then you can give it up through your own choice. If you choose to do it, then you can unchoose to do it, right? Did somebody lay this on him? Did Gwydion say, as you know, he's being carried away, Turn, you've got to go to my father. No, he didn't. No, my decision was made long before this. What is the offer? Just stop. Just, you don't have to. I don't mean it's a temptation in the sense that Meduin is evil. It's a temptation in the sense that Meduin is testing his heart. And in the testing of it, he's helping in the forming of it. He's helping in the construction of it. All right? So be it. I grant you all that you will allow me to grant a night's rest. And he touches his forehead and the kid's asleep. Okay, so they go on. Um, let's see here. He won't listen to them. They get captured by King Adeleg and the Fair Folk. Who are, or what are the Fair Folk? Dwarves. Dwarves. In Welsh mythology, they're not dwarves. Elves or fairies. Mary Stewart, American, I think she's American, American writer, wrote a series of novels in the 1960s. One of them called, you know, These Hollow Hills. They're based on Welsh mythology, and they're about, because this is what the mythology taught, that the hills, the mountains of Wales, are full of caves. That's where the fair folk live. Why do they live in caves? 
because we people drove them beneath the ground. Same idea we hear expressed here. Okay? So, they get captured and they see Henwin there. Shut up, Siri. Um, they meet Dolly and they appeal to Idleg's page, uh, chapter 16, page 145. They appear to his honesty and honor. And that's the, that's the kicker. That's the thing that makes him give in, essentially. Page 145. Idleg says, you didn't mention a pig. No mention at all. If you told me you were looking for a pig, a pig that had been lost, I might. Tara, no, you're right, I did. But there is a question of honor, of question, honesty and honor. Honor. Yes, I was afraid you'd come to that. True, the fair folk never break their word. Well, that's the price tag. Price for being open hearted, generous, so be it, you shall have your pin. We also need weapons to replace those we lost. And food, Gertie says. You know, crunchings and munchings. Terry, yes, provisions. Okay. He not only gives them all that, what else does he do? Provides them with a guide. What kind of guide is Dolly? Good guide? Yes. Powerful? Warrior? No. Upbeat? No. Always looking on the bright side of things? No. <laughs> Doesn't he mention something about being like a failure of his family because he can't do good powers? What powers can't he do? He can't do ability. He sits there. He's kind of like Drax, you know, in the one Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm now so still, you cannot see me. And they're like, yeah, yeah. We, we see you. <laughs> <laughs> but he does later make himself invisible. Okay, So they leave with Dolly in chapter 17. The fledgling. Now, what is a fledgling? It's a baby bird. It's always a baby bird. Okay, Why? Because the fledge, that's the little feathers, not fully developed. When you fledge an arrow, you put the feathers on the back of it. Okay? Fletch an arrow. It's related. So, they leave, and they come across this thorn bush. And in the thorn bush is a baby guithaint. And Dolly essentially says, kill it. Terrence says, nope, I won't have it killed. It's in pain. Page 155. It needs help. My laundry. True, but doesn't look comfortable. Fluter says, yeah, I'd listen to Dolly. <laughs> he knows about these things. I don't like chopping things up, but. Terrence, bottom of page 155. Medwin would not say so. In the hills, he spoke of kindness for all creatures, and he told me much about the Grithanes. I think it's important to bring this one to care death. No one has ever captured a live Grithank, as far as I know. As far as I know. Well, how much does he know, really? <laughs> I mean, this, this is his in real education. He, who can tell what value it may have? Yeah, okay. So what do they do? They build a little cage. They take the Grithank out of the thorns. They put it in the cage. They feed it. It tries to bite them. You know, if it could, it would kill them. All right. 157. So they're making the cage and they're screwing it up. And Dolly says, just stop. <coughs> so he makes a good cage for them. Um, it allows Arlanri to feed it. Page 159. They wake up the next morning and the bird's gone. And Dolly says, told you. Now he's going to go report back to where we are. We're all going to die. Yeah, it's because you're nice to the good thing. Karen, middle of the page, just beyond. I've done the wrong thing again. That again, I just keep screwing up. Dolly is right. There's no difference between a fool and an assistant pig keeper. But Ilan Reed tries to cheer him up. That's probably true. She agreed. 
But I can't stand people who say, I told you so. Notice, she's saying, Dolly, don't say I told you so. Even though you're probably right, and Tara probably is a fool. It's worse than somebody coming up and eating your dinner before you have a chance to sit down. Okay? So the cauldron born come upon them. And let's see here. Columns of the Horn King. Chapter 18. We're going to skip the rest of that. Um, they drive them away. Yeah, now we're going to skip a lot, actually. Go to... Gwydion shows up. Gwydion shows up. Where does that begin? Page... 174.75. Gwydion stands in the doorway. Terran did not recognize him. Um, he's got a wounded arm. He explains what happened to him, which, which I'm skipping. And I want to pick up with 178.179. Yeah, we're almost... Gwydion says, Yeah, back up. 177. Gwydion tells them about Akron. And he says that she told him, I ruled Perdane long before Iran. It was I who made him king over Anuvan. It was I who gave him power, though he used it to betray me. Now, if you desire it, you shall take your place on the high throne of Iran himself, and will instead. And he says, I'll overthrow Iran. I'll use those powers to destroy you. She throws him into the dungeon. Okay, why does she really, what does she really mean when she says, if you want to overthrow Iran, I will help you, and I will make you the high king. And that she ruled for Dane before. That's important. What does she see when she looks at Gwydion? Another puppet maybe that she could use? Possibly. I think it's more than that. Husband material. Oh. Oh, yeah. I want to do Describe him. Is he old and ugly? He's weathered. He's weathered. Doesn't mean he's ugly. He's weathered like, if you're familiar with the, the actor Sam Elliott, He's like Sam Elliott's with it. Okay? You can tell this guy's been out and you know on the farm a lot. Okay. But how old does this make her? She gotta be old. She gotta be old. But she looks nothing no older than 30. This is what magic will do for you. Okay? So he says he throws she throws him into the lowest pit. And it has a name. Eth aneth or F aneth or something like that. There's a pronunciation guide at the back. I forgot to look at it. It's better that I don't speak of the torment she devised. The worst went out of the body, but of the spirit. And of, the, of these, the most per painful was despair. Yet even in my deepest anguish, I clung to hope. For there is this about uh, Eth aneth. If a man withstand it, even death will give up its secrets to him. And he says, I withstood it. I didn't give in to despair. And at the end, much was revealed to me, which before had been clouded. I'm not going to tell you. It's enough for you to know I understood the workings of life and death. Laughter and tears, endings, beginnings. I saw the truth of the world. I knew no change could hold me. My bonds were light as dreams. And the prison melts. What kind of prison was it? It was a prison she had created in his mind. She made him think he was really in prison. And when he understood all these things, life, death, etc., etc., what what happened to Akron? I don't know. We asked. I don't, I don't know. I didn't see her afterwards. He says, I saw a spiral castle in ruins when I went to find you guys. And what did he assume? I thought you guys were dead. Last time I saw Terry, you know, he 
Terrence says, hey, we mourn you too, so we've all buried each other now. <laughs> so he says, I went out for Caradathel. A guithate plunged from the sky, flew directly toward me, 179. It neither attacked nor sped away after. It had seen me, but fluttered before me, crying strangely. Its language is no longer secret to me. So when he says, I understood the workings of life and death, laughter and tears, in its beginnings, I saw the truth of the world. It's kind of like, I now understand how everything in the world works. I understand the language of beasts and animals and birds and such. Every living creature. And I understood a band of travelers was journeying from the hills nearby and a white pig accompanied them. Okay. Um, talk about the Horn King, his name. Gwydion says, once you, have, once you have courage to look upon evil, seeing it for what it is, naming it by its true name, it is powerless against you. Do we see that echoed in any modern work of fantasy literature? It's an AA. Okay, it is part of AA. What do you have to do? You have to name your problem. I once had a priest, I'm Orthodox, you know, we do confession and stuff, but I once had a priest tell me one time, um, I don't remember what the context was. In one of the Gospels, Jesus is healing somebody. I can't remember who it is. Kid who throws himself into a fire in the water. So he throws himself in the fire to kill himself, throws himself in the water to kill himself. Not how a normal kid acts, right? Okay. And his father goes to Jesus and says, you know, Lord, help my son. He has a spirit who causes him to do this. Thing. And Jesus goes up. And he doesn't just immediately heal him. He says, who are you? That is, what's your name? And the, legion, the spirit says, we are legion, for we are many. Okay. Commands them out, sends them into the swine, they go down and, you know, drown in the thing. That's kind of naming the problem, okay? So, Gwydion says, once you, what's the, the other work of fantasy? What is Lord Voldemort called? By almost everybody. He who must not be named. He who must not be named. Why? Because it's thought the name itself conveys power. Dumbledore tells Harry, teaches Harry. Do not fear his name. Fear of a name of something does what? Increases fear of the thing itself. So, call him by his name. And so when we actually see Lord Voldemort appear with Dumbledore together, book five, Dumbledore doesn't call him Lord Voldemort. He calls him by his real name. And I think it would have been even better if she had really emphasized what Dumbledore meant there. And doesn't call him Tom. He calls him Tom because he's an adult. It's Tom Riddle at that point. It's in his 60s. Okay? I think it would have been better if Dumbledore probably called him what he called him when he was an 11-year-old and first came to Hogwarts. Tommy. Tommy. Stop. <clears throat> Just imagine how angry that would make Lord Voldemort. I'm not Tommy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> because later on in the book, we see a vision, we see a memory, and he calls him Tommy. He goes, you got to know, people don't call me that anymore. He goes, yeah, but that's how I know you, so that's what I'm going to call you. All right? So, once you have courage to look upon evil, seeing it for what it is, and naming it by its true name, it's powerless against you. And you can destroy it. There's an awful lot there, more than we have time for. Seeing it for what it is. What is evil? Big philosophical question. It's the absence of good. It's the <laughs> lack of good. The evil does not, quote unquote, exist on its own according to philosophers and theologians. It's a negation of something. Like darkness is the absence of light. You, you don't describe light as more darkness, right? 
it's, it's not in addition to. It's like it's the constant state. Darkness can only be taken away. So, seeing it for what it is, that it is nothing, really. It is a parasite. It merely lives off something else. And naming it by its true name, then it becomes powerless. Yet with all my understanding, I could not have discovered the Horn King's name without Hinwin. Okay? He told me the secret. So, uh, wait, how did I? Yeah. So, he destroyed the Horn King, and we find out. Page 180 and 181. For some reason, I thought I had like 50 more pages. Um, Ilan recalls what, you know, asks, what was his name? I'm not going to tell you. So they rest for a while. And Karen's allowed to walk around wherever he wants in Karadathal, and Gwydion walks with him sometimes. And they stand on a hill. They overlook the, all the, you know, land and such. And Gwydion summons all of them, this is page 180, to the Great Hall. And they meet King Math, son of Methanoe, ruler of the House of Dawn. He's old and talkative. And we're told, but when at last he had finished one of the longest speeches Taryn had ever heard, the companions bowed, a guard of honor bore King Math from the hall on a litter draped with a cloth of gold. And as Taryn and his friends were about to take their leave, Gwydion calls to them. And he says, I've got some gifts to give to you for great valor. You guys deserve an award or reward. It's in my power to bestow them, which I do with a glad heart, and with hope that you will treasure them not so much for their value as for the sake of remembrance. Remembrance of what? Of the giver, of me. Don't value these things for their intrinsic worth, but because I gave them to you. So, Fluters first. To Fluter Flam shall be given one harp string. The wall others break, this shall forever hold, regardless of how many gallant extravagances he may put on. Gallant extravagances. That's a beautiful euphemism for wild embellishment. Okay? Like, he gets in a fight with one guy, and when he sings a song about it, he puts down a thousand. And its tone shall be the truest and most beautiful. So, this string will never break. To Dolly the Fair Folk shall be granted the power of invisibility so long as he chooses to retain it. Well, that's kind of interesting that he can confer that power. Tells us an awful lot about Gwydion. To faithful and valiant Gurdon shall be given a wallet of food which shall be always full. Dip your hand. It's like Mary Poppins' bag. Dip your hand in, there's always food there. Well, what's Gurdjie always talking about? Crunchy, Munchies crunchy, and crunchies. Crunchy. Okay? It's his beast-like characteristic. It is one of the treasures of Prydain. So it's like a national treasure. And he's giving it to this, whatever he is, to Ilanri of the House of Lear shall be given a ring of gold set with a gem carved by the ancient craftsmen of the fair folk. It is precious. But to me, your friendship is even more precious. Why does she get a ring? What is she carrying around with her? Her bobble. Her little gold slash crystal ball. Because sometimes it's described as gold, and sometimes it's described as clear, being like crystal. So she gets another gem like it, the ring. And to Taryn, choice of his reward has been the most difficult of all. What can I give you? What was the very first thing Gwydion gave to Taryn? Almost immediately upon meeting he gives him a sword. 
She says, it's not a good one. It's not the best one. It's what I have. Okay? What did he want from the beginning of the story? He wants to make a sword. And now he's been given a sword. Now, Terry's probably thinking, oh, I'm going to get a sword. I'm going to get a real sword. I don't want a reward. <clears throat> I want no friend to repay me for what I did willingly. Now, when he says willingly, he says, I did this out of friendship and for my own honor. I didn't do this for any reward. I didn't do it for pay. He says, I did it, why? For my friendship with you and Fluter and Ilonli and my own honor. What's he mean, my own honor? Once he thought Gwydion was dead, what did he believe? That it was his job to go and tell um, the king. He's got to find a way to get to Kyrdaf. He set that upon himself. He was going to die trying. He was going to act honorably. He wasn't acting out of self-interest. Okay? Gwydion smiles. Touchy and headstrong as ever. What do you mean? Would you shut the, you know what, up? <laughs> Just shut up and listen for once. <laughs> That's why I think he's early teens. 13, 15, probably. He just doesn't know when to shut his mouth. <laughs> Believe that I know what you yearn for in your heart. That's the honor, the glory. Okay? The dreams of heroism, of worth, and of achievement are noble ones. Heroism, worth, achievement. Noble dreams, but only you can make them come true. Only you can become a hero. Only you can do what in relation to worth? Does your worth come from somebody else? No. Saying you are worthy? No, it doesn't. It comes from what? You show, the phrase is, your true colors. Colors in that phrase, refers to your emblem, your flag. Old naval battles. You know, when two ships are see each other at a vast distance on the sea, and they don't know whose side they're on, they often would not reveal themselves until they're just about to flip up the cannon doors and let them have a broadside. And then run up the colors, and you see the Union Jack. Or you see the French flag or the Spanish flag or something. Okay? Heroism, worth. Well, how do you do that? How do you show heroism? How do you show your worth? Achievement. You do things. Okay? He says, you can make those come true. But, so I can't do that for you, kid. So what do you want? Whatever else. Ask. I will grant it. In spite of all that has befallen me, and I have come to love the valleys and mountains of your northern lands. Looks like something is missing, but it's not. In spite of all that has befallen me, I have come to love the valleys and mountains of your northern lands. But my thoughts have turned more and more to care Dalvin. I want to go home. I long to be home. Okay. That's his gift. You get to go home. Does he? Physically, he goes back to Kerdalvin, right? We're told the next chapter, it's swift, unhindered. Oh, yeah. I know what you're saying. Okay. So, they get back 184, 185. Alon, we says to Taryn, so you'll go back to being assistant pig keeper? He's, you know, I was hoping. I mean, I was wondering. Um, Dalvin comes in. And Dalvin says, uh, we need to have a talk. Taryn and I. First, I'm interested to learn what you think of being a hero. What did Gwydion say? You have to make yourself 
into a hero. Dalbin says, what do you think of being a hero? What's the difference? Greedy implies it hasn't happened yet. Dalbin says, kid, you already are one. You already helped save Pritain. I dare say you feel rather proud of yourself, but I don't, you don't look proud. Right? Because if you're a hero, you should be full of pride. You should be all puffed up. I have no just cause for pride. It was Gwydion who destroyed the Horned King. Hinwin helped him do it. Gurgi, not I, found her. That is Hinwin. So, Gwydion destroyed the evil threat. Stupid pig helped him. Whatever this thing is, found the stupid pig. What's he saying about his involvement in all that? I didn't do anything. Dolly and Fluter fought gloriously while I was wounded by a sword I had no right to draw. We skipped over that passage. He tries to draw Dernwin out, but what happens? Burns his hand, knocks him unconscious, makes it so he can't use his arm. And Gwydion's kind of like, you shouldn't be touching that. <laughs> and Ilanwi was the one who took the sword from the barrel in the first place. What I mostly did was mistakes. I screwed up from one end of Pridane to another. Well, those are complaints enough to dampen the merriest feet. Like, man, you're a... <laughs> Though what you say may be true, you have cause for a certain pride. What's that cause? What's that pride? It was you who held the companions together and led them. You did what you set out to do. Hinwin is safely back with us. What did he set out to do? Find Hinwin. Hinwin's found, right? Hinwin's returned. If you make mistakes, you recognize them. What's Dalvin saying? In a little way, Recognizing mistakes is what? That's heroic. There's an awful lot of people, they can't admit their mistakes. What do they do? Blame others. Wasn't me. As I told you, there are times when the seeking counts more than the finding. He sought Henwin. He didn't personally find her. He sought the Horn King. He didn't personally defeat him. But he sought. He tried. It was his trying that did what? Brought everybody together. That enabled the ultimate quest to be fulfilled. Does it truly matter which of you did what? Since all shared the same goal, the same danger? You know, the SEAL Team 6 that took out Bin Laden all the other members of SEAL Team of that, at that time, because, I mean, they changed a bit. But all the members of that SEAL Team that went and took out Bin Laden, all of those who were not the one who shot him, got a bit upset when the one who shot him publicly took credit several years later. Why? Broke the code. What one person does, the whole team does. Period. And the one guy took credit. Okay? What's Dalvin saying? You were part of the group, and what happened? The Horn King was defeated. You were part of the group. Henwin was found. Without you as part of the group, neither would have happened. Nothing we do is ever done entirely alone. Nothing we do is ever done entirely alone. We all have help. I don't mean Elizabeth Warren's, you didn't build this nonsense. That, you know, everybody, no. What does he mean? He had assistance, right? And he was the assistance along the way. From what I hear, you've been as impetuous as your friend Fluter. 
I've been told, among other things, of a night when you dove headfirst into a thorn bush. I don't know if you've ever been in a thorn bush. I was, la I was at my dad's early part of August. My mom died several years ago, and he's older, and he's getting Alzheimer's too. And, you know, the police is just going to hell. And my brother tries to take care of it, but it's an acre, and my brother has a job, and so he can, you know, spend a couple hours a week over there. Well, he had these rose bushes in this part of the garden, and it's like this from here to there, just 12 feet tall, and you couldn't see there. And so, being the damn fool I am, I go in there with a pair of loping shears and stuff, and my brother-in-law and I, we start pulling these things up, and I'm talking thorns on those suckers an inch and a half long. Now, I'm smarter than my brother-in-law because I wear jeans. He's wearing shorts, and his legs look like, you know, cats just crawled up them. All right? You dove into a thorn bush. Not, you know, kind of wriggled your way in by the shoulder. No, it's head first. Why? You thought Gwydion was in danger. And you have certainly felt as sorry for yourself as Gurgi, and like Dolly, striven for the impossible. Karen, yeah, you're right. I've done all those things. But that's not what troubles me. I have dreamed often of Kara Dolbin. And I love it. I love it. And you and Call, more than ever, that is, and I've dreamed often of you and Paul, and I love you too, more than ever. I ask for nothing better than to be at home. And my heart rejoices. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be back. Why? Because sleeping on your own bed is a hell of a lot better than sleeping anywhere else. It's part of what I think he's getting at. I've returned to the chamber I slept in. I found it smaller than I remember. Fields are beautiful, not quite as I recalled them. And I'm troubled, for I wonder now if I am to be a stranger in my own home. Dolbin's like, come on. It's not Karen Dolbin that's gotten smaller. You're bigger. Hello. Reality, you've grown. Is that it? It's partly it. How else is he bigger other than physically bigger? He's He's more mature. He's gone off and experienced what? I mentioned last last week, yeah, whatever it was. I think it was this class. It might have been my Tolkien class. You know, the, the short story by Ernest Hemingway, Soldier Song, about a guy who lives, who leaves Podunksville, Oklahoma, and goes off to fight in World War I, and then lives in Paris afterwards for a while, and then he goes back to Podunksville. The story is, called, story is called Soldier's Home. He can't go back home. Well, that's, that's what Karen is experiencing. He's experienced the wide world. And now he's gone back to little old Murfreesboro. <laughs> My kids can't wait to get out of Murfreesboro. Why? Because I've spoiled them. How have I spoiled them? Well, I've mentioned I've taught this Harry Potter course in London. I taught it in London. 2003, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. And four of those times, four of those times, they came for two weeks or longer, two to three weeks. So they've spent, you know, over a month, close to two months or so of their total lives living in London. And if you've never been to London, Samuel Johnson would say, you've never lived. And so they go from London, 11 million people, Greatest theaters in the world, greatest nightlife, horrible food, great beer, to Murfreesboro. <laughs> They've been to Prague, been there for two weeks. My daughter was teaching English over there, so we visited her for Christmas. Why? We saved up all our, you know, money. And one of the most beautiful cities in all of Europe, one of the oldest cities in all of Europe, not damaged by World War II at all and they came back to Murphy's Grove and it's just kind of like it's just not the same that's how Taryn feels I wonder if I'm going to be a stranger in my own home why? because now he kind of wants more Dolly Taryn, oh yeah plus 
There's I Lonely. What's going to happen to her? Dalvin pursed his lips, toyed with the pages of the Book of Three. Well, she's a princess. She should be returned to her kinsman. Yes, she is a princess. Didn't she tell you? Well, she did tell him what? She's the daughter of a king. Maybe his education didn't include figuring things out. No hurry about that. She might consent to stay. Notice, Karen makes it sound like Dalvin has the authority to say... She will stay. He says, it's up to her. Perhaps if you spoke to her. I shall. He runs out. He tells her, you're to stay. Notice, do you want to stay? No, you have to stay. I've asked all of it. Well, I suppose it never occurred to you to ask me, why do we get this at the very end of the book? What's going on? Teenagers, hormones. <laughs> I, I, I didn't think. You usually don't. <laughs> wow. Typical woman, man. Just wow. <laughs> no matter, call a straightening up a place for me. Already? How did he know? How did you know? What's that tell us about Taryn? Clueless as ever. How did they know? Have we heard Taryn going on and on and on about Ilani since he returned? Nope. So how did they know that he didn't? Because apparently he has been going on and on and on and on about her. Um, any other questions, comments? Getting out early. All right, so for next week... We'll do the same kind of thing. Hopefully, you know, I'm going to come in and I'm going to ask, maybe I didn't begin this class that way. I did all my others today. Um, I'm going to start off by saying, do you have any questions? You know, try to come up with some as you read. You really don't want me to come up with them because I'll come up with some sort of quizzes other than names. Yeah, those are good questions. You like those questions, huh? Uh -huh.